Amen. Thank you, Bishop. Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's give the Lord a shout of praise in the house right now. Come on now. When I say let's give the Lord a shout of praise, that means open your mouth and let us shout out. Amen. Come on, there's freedom in the house and there's liberty. Let's just praise the Lord and magnify him for what he's doing. Amen. Amen. I am, I, I'll tell you, tell you, there, there's probably about seven of you that are here today and you have such a spirit of heaviness on you and there is nothing I can do for you. I'm not saying that to be mean-spirited, but until you respond to what you know is right and you just lift your hands and begin to exalt Jesus, Jesus can do something for you. I can't, amen. And so I feel like there's a challenge today. If you want out from underneath that banner of heaviness, you need to lift your hands and just go ahead and say, you know what, I don't care what's going on in my life. I don't care what I'm facing. I'm going to magnify Jesus in the house, amen. Come on, I'm going to magnify Jesus. Oh, he's awesome. Amen, amen. As you turn turn with me to Luke chapter 19, we'll begin with verse 1. I, I woke up this morning, Bishop, and I'll tell you, I don't know how, how to really uh, communicate what I felt, but I know this, that the name of Jesus is going to be exalted today. Amen. There, there is such a, a moving and an unction, at least in my spirit. I feel like the name of Jesus will be exalted today. Amen. There's power in the name of Jesus. Amen. There's no other name like the name of Jesus. Amen. That's in it. Isn't it funny how Peter, when he was pulled into to question, he said, well, amen. How? The council said, what, how, what power, what authority? Did you do this? And they're just like, well, if we're going to be examined this day, the deed done to the impotent, man, we're going to go ahead and lay it out there. And he says, we, this was performed or this happened due to the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And he goes on to say, I believe in Acts 4, 12, and he says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name uh, uh, under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Amen. The name of Jesus is a powerful name. Amen. Strongholds fall at the name of Jesus. Sins are washed away in baptism at the name of Jesus. Sickness flees at the name of Jesus. Does anybody love the name of Jesus today? Amen. Amen. I'm thankful to be here, Bishop, to give you and your wife and this, this church high honor. We're so thankful and grateful for your kindness and your hospitality. Amen. Luke chapter 19, beginning with verse 1. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. Everybody turn to your neighbor, smile, and say, I know about Zacchaeus. Come on, there was, a, there was a Sunday school song. Does anybody know that Sunday school song, Zacchaeus was a? All right, everybody, I think, knows a little bit about Zacchaeus. Amen. He was the wee little man. And, and the, Bible, the Bible lets us see a little glimpse into Zacchaeus, his physical life. Watch what it says. It says, he was the chief among the publicans and... Turn to your neighbor say, he was like you. The Bible says he was rich. Amen. And so we get a little insight into this man named Zacchaeus. He was chief among the publicans, and, and he had loaded pockets. He had deep pockets. He was a rich man. But then verse 3, it kind of flips the coin, and it now begins to give us insight into his spiritual life, if you would, the spiritual aspect. And, and it says this, and he sought Jesus to see who he was. Amen. There's something powerful about a person that will seek after Jesus to find out who he really is. Amen. And the Bible says this, and he could not. There was a dilemma because he was little of stature. And watch verse 4. This is going to be where the next two verses where I'll draw my title from. And the Bible says that he ran. Turn to your neighbor and say he ran. Come on. And he climbed. Turn to your other neighbor and say he climbed. Amen. In a sycamore tree for to see him, for he was the pass that way. And watch this. And when Jesus came to the place, what place? The place where Zacchaeus decided to do something about what was inside. 
When Jesus came to the place where Zacchaeus took some action and made something happen, amen, the Bible said he saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste, come down today, for today I must abide at thy house. Amen. I want to preach to you this morning with the help of God, with all my heart from this thought process, take action. Amen. Take action. How many How many of you feel like God is leading you deeper in ministry or deeper in your walk with God? Let me see your hands. How many of you feel like God has a special plan for your life? Come on, let me see your hands. You know that Jesus is working in your life. Is that how you feel? Amen. I think it's time to turn to your neighbor, and I'm going to give you some permission. I want you to get a little preachy. Wives, I want you to get a little preachy to your husbands. And husbands, I want you to get a little preachy to your wives. Why don't you turn to them and say, hey, stop talking about it. That was, that was a little weak. I gave you a license to get a little preachy. That was weak. I said, turn to your neighbor and say, why don't you stop talking about what you want to do and start doing what you want to do? Come on, I, I don't want to hear any more talk about how you're going to do this or how this is going to happen. I want to see some action. Amen. Amen. Let's put our Bibles down. Let's lift our hands and let's ask God that his name would be glorified here this morning. Jesus, we love you. We're, you're awesome. There's none like you. Today, God, we all feel your, your spirit, your presence is so real. It's tangible, Lord. There's nobody here today that should walk out of here and not have a fresh encounter with you. You are here to touch people's lives. You're here to transform us. Uh, you're here to interact with us, God. You're here to heal the sick. You're healed, uh, Lord, deliver people from infirmities, Lord, to lift up the weariness. Uh, you're here to minister in all sorts of manner, and we're not going to tie your hands today. We're going to ask you to have free course uh, in this house today, Lord. Speak to us through your word and change us. And everybody say in Jesus name. Amen. High five your neighbor as you're seated. <laughs> Amen. There is a, uh, a saying that goes something like this and if, if you have ever heard this saying I want you to finish this saying with me. Let's have a little bit of a dialogue here this morning. The saying goes something like this. Actions speak We've all heard it. Say it one more time. Actions speak louder than words do. Amen. Every person in here speaks at least two languages. Did you know that? Two languages. I personally have mastered the art of speaking five languages in my life. I, I have spoken, I can't really say too well, in my native tongue of, of English. I, I speak in the English language. I, I have spoken in tongues when the Holy Ghost came, and I continue to exercise that, that heavenly language. Amen. I can also speak fluently the language of the white-tailed deer and also the North American turkey. Amen. I, I have learned the art. And I know that doesn't do anything to you here because I asked Friday, who's a hunter? And nobody raised their hand. And so I felt like a fish out of the water with you all Friday. I mean, I couldn't imagine. I told the risottos last night. I said, I could not imagine going through life and not at least spending one day in a tree stand. I said, Lord, help us. Amen. And so I speak. I can talk. I, I know the language. I know the, the vocalization of the white-tailed deer. I know the vocalization of the turkeys. And, and, I, and I know when I start doing a, a soft tree yelp in the morning before really the, the turkeys are ready to fly off the roost. And I, if I hear a, a tom fire off, I can begin to decipher his language and his body language just based on that, that sound. And so I can speak that language. And then lastly, it's the language that we all speak speak, and that is the language of body language. Amen. Everybody say it with me. Actions speak louder than words do. Amen. Here, here are a few uh, little known facts about nonverbal communication that, that I went and I, I studied. I first studied this in uh, construction specialties when I was an estimator. My, my job, they, they wanted every, to improve the workplace environment, and so they talked about communication. And this is where I first started learning this. And, and so I went back and I kind of dived into this some more. But here's what I found. Body language has three major uses. One, as a conscience replacement for speech. Okay, it's just, 
it's just a, a natural uh, reaction. If if you order something and they bring out your dessert, one time uh, nobody wanted to order a dessert, and so I was the guy that was going to look like the hog, and I said, I'll take dessert, and then everybody else grabbed menus and started looking at it, and, and I ordered at, at Longhorn Steakhouse, I ordered the chocolate stampede. I don't know if you've ever had that or not, but when, when, you, when you order a picture or a, 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 a an entree or dessert off the menu and you look at the picture, a lot of times the picture supersedes what actually comes out. But in this case, it didn't. When they came out with a, a chocolate stampede, it was literally on a plate that was like the size of my iPad. There were two pints of ice cream in the middle or on the edges and a swedge of cake in the middle. And I'm like, score! But when they brought it out, they did, I didn't have to speak. They knew that I was excited about what just was placed in front of me. Why? Because the smile went from ear to ear, and I'm just like. So it's a conscience replacement for speech. Two, it reinforces speech, your body language. Listen, I, I'm a real man, and, and, and there are times where my children, they just do not listen. And, and I tell them 1,600 times, uh, go clean your room, and they choose to go outside. And about the 1,500th time, uh, no longer am I saying, oh, dear child of mine, I want you to go and clean your room. Now I'm opening up the, the, the ouchy spoon drawer, and I'm digging through all the spoons. And they know, without even me saying a word, they know what's going to happen if they don't go up and clean the room. So your body language can start to reinforce your speech. And then three, it's a mirror or betrayal of the mood. You got any sassy teenagers in the house? Huh? Huh? Yes, Mom, I'll clean my room. Yes, dear, I took out the trash. So it's a mirror or betrayal of the mood. Out of all the facial expressions, the smile may, may be the most deceptive. There are around 18 different smiles, but only one, and I believe this is how you say it, the Duchenne smile reflects true, genuine happiness. When a person crosses both their arms and their legs, they have emotionally withdrawn from the conversation. Man, I see you fold your arms, but if you cross your legs, we're going to have problems. You're going to give me a complex. <clears throat> uh, there are six universal facial expressions. One is anger. Two is disgust, three is fear, four is happiness, five is sadness, and six is surprise. And recently, scientists have argued that the looks of contempt and embarrassment are also universal facial expressions. Eye blocking, delaying open the eyes, lowering the eyelids for a prolonged period of time is a very powerful display of consternation and disbelief or disagreement. How many know what I'm talking about? You're talking, and, and your child's just they're, just, they're just going on of why they're justified and why they're validated for disobeying and you know, the whole time. You're just like, huh? I see a lot of people shaking your heads. There's a lot of wives shaking their heads. Husbands, are you doing all right this morning? <laughs> this is my favorite because I pick on my wife with this, but this is, and I found this on Google. It's on the Internet. It's true. A woman has a wider ranging peripheral vision, which allows her to check out her husband from head to toe without getting caught. A man's peripheral vision is poorer. That's why he will have to gaze up and down if he's going to get the full view or have to turn his head. Now watch what, that, that's why I, so many times I'm like, oh, babe, look at the Lamborghini. And she's just looking straight ahead and it's already here. She's like, yeah, I've seen it. You didn't even turn your head. It was a Lambo. Oh, you mean the one with the pinstripes, the red this, black worms, blah, blah. I'm like. But watch this. Science says that, that men do not oogle more than ladies. It's just men get caught because they don't have a strong peripheral vision. And so as a husband, I decipher that and say this, uh, even though I don't see my wife checking me out, she's still checking me out. Amen. I still have it. One study showed that the total impact of a message is 7% verbal, words only, 38% vocal, including the tone or, or the inflection of the voice. 
and uh, the sound, or and then it's 55% nonverbal. Everybody, would you say it with me one more time? Actions uh, speak louder than words do. I could go on and on and on this morning about these different body languages and all this, but I think that we would probably agree that your body language and your actions uh, really tell the story more than what your words are saying the story is. And I have a young brother. My, I had three biological siblings, my brother, me, and my sister. And then when we graduated, my mom and dad, they adopted five more siblings. And, and now three of them are in Bible college, and two of them are getting ready to go to Bible college. And, and the two, I have two teenagers. Boy, the one knows better. The other one, he's just full of sassiness, and and he trash talks me all the time. And it's like I was just up there, and it's like I'll walk into a room and I'll look at him. He'd be like, "What are you looking at?" I don't know. I haven't quite figured that out yet. He's like, oh, and that we're brothers. So why don't you come say it to my face? I said, I just said it to your face. So I give it right back to him. He's like, I'm going to come out there. I'm going to pick you up. I'm going to throw you through the floor, go down in the basement, throw you back up, and we're going to work our way. I said, what are you going to do about it? He's like, he's like let's, let's go outside. And I'm like, why don't we start inside and work our way outside? And he will just run his gums at me nonstop. And, and it's finally, Bishop, I'll just get to the point, like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do about it? Come on, what are you going to do about it? You're, I say you're just going to sit there and you're going to flap your gums and you aren't going to do nothing about it. And I tell him, listen, if I tell you I'm going to do something about it, you better believe it that when the time comes, uh, I'm going to get up, walk over there, and put a whooping on you. <laughs> it's, the saying also goes like this. They were all bark and no you know what can happen in life? You can gain a reputation of being a talker and not a doer. You can gain a reputation on yourself of talking the talk but not walking the walk. Amen. Why? Because actions speak louder than words do. And I'm not afraid of any idle threat that my brother says because he knows as well as I do that if he gets up, he's going to walk away with the short end of the stick. I want to tell you today that words mean absolutely nothing. They are useless uh, if you have a rep unless you have a reputation uh, that you're going to do something about it. See, this isn't just on on the internet, so to speak. This is in the Bible, James chapter 2, verse 14. It says this, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man says, uh, though a man utters with his mouth, though a man speaks with his language, uh, th though he vocalizes uh, that I have faith uh, and he has not works. There is no physical action. There is no evidence. Uh, he poses the question, can faith save him? And then he draws an analogy or a little picture for us, and he says, if, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, you give them not the things which are needed for the body. What did it profit? In other words, if we had somebody in dire need, their house just burnt down, they had no money, no food, no clothes. They came in and we were all like, oh, we're so sorry for that. Why don't you go with a full stomach, go with warm clothes and, and have the needs that you need or the supplies that you need. And we didn't give them money, we didn't give them food. Did it profit anything? And then verse seven, 17, it says this, even so faith, if it hath not works, it's what? It's dead being alone. Amen. Uh, hear me this morning when I say you can say all you want uh, that this is going to be the week that I give my life to Jesus. Uh, you can say all you want that this is the week that I'm going to turn my life around or I'm going to go deeper in the things of God and deeper in the ministry. But until you start putting actions behind your words, uh, it means nothing. It's void. Uh, it doesn't matter. It, uh, it's not until you start to act upon what's inside that it actually counts. Let's just take the idea of repentance for an example. Repentance is an opportunity that we all have to get our lives right with God. Would you agree? If I came down with my brother right here with his wife, did an amazing job today. If I came down and I kicked you as hard as I could in the shin, what do you think he would do? I'll tell you what he'd do. He would grab his leg, fall out of his pew, and he would scream like a little girl. And 
I said, oh, I don't know what came over me. I am so sorry. Would you forgive me? Would you forgive me? Be, just say yes for the sake of, you know, helping the message. And as I turned around, I turned and I kicked him again in the same spot. Now, I could have went to college for football. I, was a, I could punt. I can still get my leg above my head. I could kick a mean football. And so I can kick. I kicked him again. He falls out of his feet, grabs his leg, screams like a little girl. I, I do not know what's coming over me. I am so sorry. Now, I know what most of you are thinking. You're reaching back to you. Am I carrying today? <laughs> and then the third time, I apologize. The second time, the third time, I turn and I kick him again. What do you think's going to happen? Come on, talk with me. What do you think's going to happen? He, he isn't going to say nothing. This is what it's going to look like. Now I know what he's thinking. You gave me two kicks too many. I would have did that on the first kick. <laughs> but you see, this idea of repentance, it's not just something you say. There has to be action behind repentance. Otherwise, you're not truly sorry. You can't keep telling Jesus you're sorry that you've doing this and sorry for that uh, and not change your lifestyle because at some point in time, Jesus just takes a step back, uh, puts his hands in his pocket and says, uh, you're really not sorry because you're continuing uh, to act different. Uh, you say one thing, but your actions are telling a different story. And so actions speak louder than words. This concept of actions bearing more importance than word is also borne out many times in the Scripture. John 6, verse 66, just prior to this verse, Jesus is talking to his disciples. And he says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you're not going to have a part, part in me. And what, what happened in verse 66, the Bible says, and from that time forward, many of his disciples walked no more with him. They left him. And it bothered Jesus in so much that he turns to the original 12 and says, are you going to leave me also? And then what happens? Peter speaks up and he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? Where are we going to go? In other words, Peter says this. He said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You're the Savior. You, you, you have eternal life. In other words, to interpret that is, Lord, we have already walked away from everything that we knew. We're, we walked away from our houses, our fishing, uh, fishing, our business. Uh, we have forsaken all and have followed you, Jesus. Uh, we're not here, here because everything is easy and because we spoke it. Uh, in other words, our, wor our actions uh, should tell you that we're not going to leave you when the going gets tough. Peter was saying proof, proof. Proof that we love you, proof that we, we, we are a follower of you is in our actions. In other words, he was saying, Jesus, uh, we're not like those uh, that when the bank account's full and everything's good, then we come to church. Uh, but when it gets hard and the going gets tough, uh, then we miss church. Uh, Peter was saying, Lord, we follow you when it's easy and we follow you when it's hard. Uh, we follow you on the mountaintops and we follow you in the valleys. Uh, we're not just an easy Christianity. We love you. We live for you. And proof of that is in our actions. In our actions. So Jesus really begins to dig on this idea that, that actions speak louder than words. And, and he re begins to dig when he's talking to the Pharisees in Matthew 15, verse 8. The Pharisees were the ones that, uh, you know, they said one thing, but they did another thing. They were like, they were like the, you know, your, your old uncle. He's like, don't do as I do, do as I. Actually, I just pulled that on my daughter Madison, and, and it was embarrassing. One night after a youth event, late, I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm getting Coke, a drink of Coke, and, and I don't normally drink that. And I'm like, look, 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 look. And she comes over and gets some Coke, and I'm like, Maddie, stop, stop, put that down. That's terrible for you. Look, 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 look. And she just looks at me like. And I realized the hypocrisy behind saying one thing and doing another thing. And Jesus begins to dig. And he says this, uh, he, he says, uh, this people draw nigh unto me with their mouth. They honor me with their lips, lip service. Oh, I love Jesus. Oh, I'm, I'm, how many times have you heard this? I'm a believer. And so are the devils and they tremble. Believing that there is a God 
and that there is Jesus who died on the cross, it really does nothing for you except validates the fact that God is God or Jesus is Lord. He's died for your sins. That's why James said, unless there's actions behind your faith, it does nothing. And Jesus said, these people, they're drawing nigh to me with their lips. Oh, I love Jesus. I, 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 I you know, and, and he says, they honor me with their mouth, but watch their heart is far from me. In vain they worship me, teaching the doctrines of men and the commandments of men. And so you know what that tells us this morning? It says this, that we can miss the kingdom of God. Hear me. You can miss heaven by the space of six inches, the distance between your mouth to your heart. You know why? Because you can say what you want and you can say everything that's right. Right, uh, but unless your life is living out what you're saying, uh, it means nothing. Unless there's action, uh, unless there's proof in your lifestyle, it matters nothing. And Jesus calls them hypocrites. Why? Because they were saying one thing, but their lives told another thing. I'm telling you right now, this world is so sick and tired of false Christianity. I, I, they are so sick and tired uh, of being in the workplace and having people say to them, Oh, I'm a believer. How many of you have ever been been in a work break or a job and they know something's different about you and you start to witness and all of a sudden uh, uh, somebody from, you know, that everybody knows comes over and when they hear you talking about Jesus, this is what they say. I'm a believer. Anybody? Let me see your hands. And what is your reaction? You know Why? Because just five minutes ago, they were taking the Lord's name in vain. They were dropping the F-bomb. They were looking at dirty trash on the magazines. Uh, They were talking about the parties and the nightlife. Uh, But then when it's easy to talk about Jesus, uh, they want to say, oh, I'm a believer. I'm telling you, this world is so sick and tired of fake Christianity. Listen, when you say that you're a Christian, uh, that means that it's not just words, uh, but I'm following Jesus in my lifestyle. I'm following Jesus in my life. Uh, my actions and everything about me, everything about me should say, I am a Jesus follower. And I know that without preaching, you can't, you know, people can't be saved, but there is a saying that goes like this it says, Preach the gospel, and if necessary, Use words. What are they saying, Bishop? You shouldn't have to tell somebody you're a believer because they could have already told the story based on your lifestyle. That's why when I wor- walked into work uh, in Retrauma in Minneapolis and, and they purposely were trying to character assassinate me, I would walk by, by 10, 10, 10 pornographic magazines on my way in there and they would have them all laid out and I'd walk by with my Bible and I'd walk all the way down to the other end of the machine uh, and there I'd flip open the word of life and I'd begin to read my Bible and I got made fun of and I got mocked but it was about six months uh, that went by and Doug, he walked around the machine late at night, uh, his eyes were sunken into his head, uh, he was trembling under the influence. Uh, There was sweat beating down his face, and he said, Aaron, uh, I need your help. Uh, I'm addicted to cocaine, and I just spent my $1,800 check on crack cocaine. Uh, I need help. And I looked him in the eye, and I said, Doug, uh, I've tried to tell you there's a God in heaven. Uh, He loves you. He cares about you. Uh, He has a plan for you. Uh, He has a desire for your life. Uh, You can do better. But would he, would he have ever come to me if I was one of them? I'm telling you, this world is looking for somebody that's different. Uh, this world is looking for somebody that doesn't crack under peer pressure and do what everybody else is doing, but somebody that can stand the test of the fire. Hey Amen. Did you realize the three Hebrew boys cast into the furnace? And when they thought that that, that persecution would have swallowed them up, it didn't. And what did the king say? He said, there's a fourth one. There's a fourth. Hey, come on out. And when they came out of the persecution, there wasn't a smell of hair or burnt hair. Their skin, their clothes was all intact. And what happened? He, he began to write new laws in the crease. Nobody should speak against their God. Their God is the true God. Amen. When you stand the test of time and you stand the persecution, God's going to raise you up and people will be drawn to you. Why? Because you're authentic. Because you're real. And you don't just talk the talk, but you Isn't it amazing to you this morning that the very same people who cried out, Hosanna, Hosanna, cruci- or blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord, one moment, the very next moment, was saying what? 
very simply. You know why? Here's what I come out of heart. This is, this is all I can say about it. Is if you follow the identity of the crowds, you'll be persuaded whichever way the crowds are. And when Jesus is passing out the loaves and fishes and the miracles are happening, everybody wants to be a part. But then when he is going to a cross, nobody wants to be a part of the pain. And so they will forsake him and they will fold back into the identity of the crowds. But I say today that if there's ever a day that you need to have the identity of Jesus in your life, it is today. Amen. It, I don't care if it's hard. I don't care if you're the only one. I don't care if you get made fun of at work. You stand true to Jesus. Amen. So the Bible reveals to us two men, two men that were on the, that they believed in Jesus. And perhaps they were on the edge of selling out completely. Uh, we know this because at the death of Jesus, the Bible records these men, these two men breaking free from the crowd's expectations. And the only way that we can determine this is based upon their actions of what we read. The first man is Joseph of Arimathea, John 19:38. Joseph of Arimathea being a disciple of Jesus, watch, but secretly for fear of the Jews. He besought Pilate that he may take the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him lead. He came therefore and took the body of Jesus. Mark's version sheds a little bit more light on this detail. Watch, Mark 15, 43 says, Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also awaited for the kingdom of God, he came and he went in boldly. Somebody say boldly. Come on. And he craves the body of Jesus. Amen. And so at the death of Jesus, something switched in this man, Joseph of Arimathea. No longer did he care what anybody else thought. No longer was he going to stay in the shadows and follow Jesus. But at the death of Jesus, something happened. And he goes into Pilate. And he boldly craves the body of Jesus, not caring what he thought about him. The second man we all know, he came to Jesus first by night. Nicodemus, John 19, 39. Nicodemus also came. He came to Jesus by night, brought a mixture of myrrh, aloes, about a 100-pound weight. Then they took the body of Jesus, wound him in linen clothing, clothes with spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury him. And so something happens now at the death of Jesus. We see a transformation in Joseph of Arimathea and this man Nicodemus. These two men, they cared what the other people thought. They cared about the crowds. They cared about society. They cared about the people at the workplace, so to speak. Uh, and so they loved Jesus. Uh, they, they wanted to follow Jesus, but there was a barrier. The barrier was what other people thought. Uh, and so we get this picture that Joseph of Arimathea and, 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 and Nicodemus, they followed Jesus, uh, but they did so in the shadows. Uh, they, would, they would follow him in his teachings, uh, but they wouldn't let anybody know that they were a follower of Jesus. They they followed him, but it was from, from behind the shadows, so to speak. Uh, but then at the death of Jesus, uh, something changes, and they say, you know what? Uh, I could care less anymore about what other people think. Uh, I'm no longer going to walk with Jesus in the shadows, uh, and I'm going to come out, uh, and I'm going to boldly follow Jesus. Uh, I'm going to walk with Jesus no matter what. Uh, I'm not ashamed of Jesus anymore. Come on, I can't help but to think this morning uh, that there's some people under the sound of my voice. Uh, you, you can come to church on Sunday and you can follow Jesus, but on Monday in your workplace, uh, you slip back into the shadows. On the college, you're a little intimidated because of what others think. Uh, in the community, you, you have that fear of what they're going to think and say. I say that if there's ever a day to come out of the shadows, uh, it's today. I could care less what this world thinks. Uh, he didn't go to, they didn't go to the cross for me. Only Jesus went to the cross for me. Come on, somebody. It's time to stop worrying about what other people think. You hearing me today? It's time to stop worrying about the, what the community thinks, what the government thinks of Jesus, uh, what the spirit of this world thinks. Uh, listen, I am bold. Uh, I am a Jesus follower. Matter of fact, I slipped out to Applebee's uh, the night I drove around for about an hour, and there's a little tinge of hungerness in me. And so I went and got a half price appetizer. And I specifically asked uh, the lady, I said, uh, I want you to put me kind of in a corner. And, and she did. It's, it's really nice of her. She put me in a corner, but there was like some guys that got off work or something, and I 
I, within 30 seconds of sitting there, I heard every swear word you could possibly hear. And I just, I just looked over at him, and I thought to myself, I'm not going to put up with this trash. And so the waitress came up, and I said, hey, I'm going to move to the other end of the restaurant. I don't want to listen to this garbage anymore. And she looked at me, and she knew what I was talking about. Everybody knew what I was talking about. But so Everybody has to take a stand. I wasn't rude. I didn't say anything. But listen, I'm not going to subject myself to that garbage. Why? Because I'm a Jesus follower. That doesn't mean I'm a hater. That I, if, if I was on the street, I'd walk right up to those people just like we did, Brother Davey. Davey is what they called him, Davey. And, and my other, my other uh, friend, they were witnessing to two men. And you know what? They were cursing and swearing. So we're not, a, we're not isolating people, but there is a time to make a stand. And that lady knew this. She knew when I went to the other end of the restaurant that I don't tolerate some things. And that's okay. I don't care what they think. This does not mean we're careless, reckless, unloving. This means that we are a follower of Jesus. I remember being, I remember being in New Brunswick, Canada, preaching, preaching about uh, in a youth event, a youth camp, and I started preaching about the voice of Eliab. And when David felt felt the uh, responsibility to go kill Goliath, he went to Eliab, the eldest, and he told him, and Eliab, Eliab scolds him. He says, "I know the naughtiness and pride of your heart." And the voice of Eliab tried to silence what David knew was right in here. And what did the Bible say David did? He turned from him and he went to somebody else that would listen. And as David goes to somebody else, he finally heard, heard somebody or found somebody that would listen to the cause. I got to tell in the youth group, I said, you know what, there was about five or six people in worship. You came up, they came up front and they were dancing freely. They, 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 it, it, you could see that they didn't care what other people thought. And I said, you know what I saw? I saw a bunch of you sitting like this on the edge of your seat. At one foot, you wanted to jump in and just worship so freely and dance and worship. But then the other, other hand, you were caring what other people thought. And I began to rail. I began to rail on this voice of Eliab, the voice of your peers that will try to stop you from being who God's calling you to be, the voice of your peers that try to hold you back rather than push you forward. And I said, I wish to God that there would be something that fell in this house that we could break out of the voice of Eliab, break out of the church chains of Eliab, amen, uh, and all of a sudden when the worship team started playing, one man took off uh, around and he began to run and it was followed by another and another and another. Before I knew it, uh, the entire youth camp had exploded uh, and they were running around at one point in time. Uh, they were all up in the altars dancing and jumping and I had to stop them. You know why? Because the floor of that sanctuary literally was moving about four to five inches as they were jumping. Uh, I'm sitting up here on the pulpit being like this felt like I was on a trampoline. The youth president went down. And he said, Aaron, I could see the main beam just going like this. So I said, stop. I said, push the chairs together. The ladies discreet, discreetly, they kind of pushed the chairs together. The men, man, they just put a pile, and then they started grabbing chairs and Hulk Hogan them, them up into the pile. Amen. The youth president is just like, really, guys? And I could see it on their face. They're like, we saw a moment, and we just took the opportunity. There was a pile in the guys' section. Amen. And that entire youth camp broke out. And there wasn't one person that wasn't worshiping or dancing uh, or praising God. What are you saying? Uh, I wish to God that we could here today get past uh, what you think and what you think and what you think. Uh, I wish we could just get into the place uh, where I'm a worshiper. I'm a Jesus follower. I don't care what you think. Uh, I'm a Jesus follower. And if I'm going to worship, I'm going to worship. Uh, if I'm going to praise, I'm going to praise. Uh, and you're not going to stop me. Come on, somebody clap your hands to the Lord. Come on, the Lord's trying to impart some boldness to some people today. <coughs> Musicians, join me. So in our opening scripture text, uh, something happened to Zacchaeus. When he mixed his actions with his words or his desire to see who Jesus was. Zacchaeus had a desire, but that wasn't enough. Zacchaeus longed after Jesus. He, he believed in Jesus. He knew he was, he was somebody special, but that wasn't enough. And so here we see Zacchaeus being just a wee little man, can't see over the rest of the multitude. And the Bible says he did what? He looked at Jesus. Looked at the road he was, began to calculate.
manipulate the path of where Jesus might be going, and all of a sudden he saw a sycamore tree. What happened? This little man began to beat feet down the streets, uh, amen, and as he got to the tree, I don't know if somebody had to boost him, I don't know if he got a, a, a basket or a donkey, or he, somehow he got up to that first limb, uh, and he began to scale this tree, amen, uh, and the Bible says that when Jesus came to the place, uh, he said, Zacchaeus, uh, hey, Bubba, I want you to come out of that tree, uh, today you're going to have a visitation, today I'm going to abide at thy house, you know what I'm trying to tell you this morning, I have never seen anybody get serious about Jesus, uh, and to the place where they take action uh, and Jesus not get serious about them. Hello, I'm Bishop John Hansen and I oversee Acts 2 Ministries of Taunton, Connecticut. I'd like to thank you for watching Authentic Christianity. We've designed these 45 minutes for the purpose of inspiring and challenging you to explore the original beliefs that were taught in the first century by Jesus and his disciples. There's nothing that will change a person's life more than the discovery and implementation of God's principles. Please let us know if we can help you in your pursuit of truth. The sermons you're watching were taped live at Acts 2 Ministries. Our church is a multicultural, multi-generational body of believers from a variety of occupations, economic backgrounds, cultures, and communities throughout southern New England. Many of us came from situations that were dysfunctional and daunting, but God has changed our lives. We're excited about the many people whose lives are being transformed as they embrace the same tenets of faith and lifestyle that was embraced by first century Christians whose story has been recorded in the New Testament book of Acts. Now, we realize that some of you may want to join us in person or watch other online sermons. So, for information about our location and ministries, to access online sermons and other helpful resources, or to contact us, please visit us online at www.actsii.org. Now, I'll be the first to admit that it can be confusing for someone who's trying to determine what is really true or how God expects them to live out their faith. There's so many churches and philosophies claiming to be right, and churches are made up of imperfect people. But please, don't be discouraged in your quest for truth. God will respond to those who sincerely seek Him, and what He will do in your life, if you obey His leading, will be well worth all the effort. In fact, this program may be God's way of answering some of your prayers. The messages presented here on Authentic Christianity are designed to help you find your own personal encounter with God and to help you find a biblical faith that's grounded in Scripture rather than traditions, denominations, opinions, or creeds. We will deal with a wide range of topics including salvation, healing, recovery, how to receive the Holy Ghost, spiritual gifts, prophecy, and other everyday Christian living topics. Our goal is to help you move forward in your relationship with God so you can experience the abundant life He promised to those who obey Him. Now, for those of you who would like to visit Acts 2 Ministries, our Sunday morning service begins at 10 a.m. and ends around noon. Our service will include vibrant prayer, exuberant singing, anointed preaching, and opportunities to respond to what's preached. While many who attend dress in their Sunday best, others choose to dress business or more casual. And during that time, we provide classes for the children between the ages of 18 months and 12 years old. Now, during the week, we meet from house to house for what we call an hour of prayer and care. These small group prayer meetings allow people to ask questions, minister to one another, and pray for one another. They also provide us with an opportunity to reach out to people who may not be a part of our assembly. We have groups in 12 different communities in our region. You can find more information about prayer groups on our website. Then, on Friday nights, we offer a youth program for young people 13 years and older. 
This is a great chance for young people to enjoy teaching and good, clean fun in a supervised environment. You can find specific information on our website calendar. Once again, thank you for watching. We're praying for you as you pursue truth.